I need you to pull all the prostitution cases north of 110th Street. You need me to? Mr. Hodge does. Welcome back subscribers and non-subscribers. By the way, if you enjoy this channel's content, become a subscriber so you can be notified when new material is uploaded. Thanks in advance. We've decided to incorporate a series titled America's First. We will discuss individuals who were equipped with the intellects and determination to accomplish outstanding things at a time in this country where there was outright bold blatant racism against black americans the tripped out part about racist laws and practices is this country claims that the u.s constitution was written by their european forefathers which includes the 1866 civil rights act that specifically addressed racism and calls racism a badge of slavery, yet here we are. Black America now and before still faces obstacles cleverly dressed up to not appear to be racism, but the old vile institution is still at work today. I don't care what the bought and paid for folks say otherwise. As much as people pride themselves on preaching obey the law, many things have been done by their own hands to willfully break every law set in place to assure and protect every black american's rights i so appreciate these first individuals tenacity knowingness and determination to dare to accomplish things drilled in their minds and souls to believe couldn't be accomplished due to their skin color which is completely un unbelievably absurd to the one billionth power every barrier they dared to obliterate destroyed every lie created to stigmatize black america worldwide let's begin eunice roberta hunton carter was born in atlanta georgia to william hunton senior who founded the black division of the ymca her mother ada waits hunton was a social worker whose work with the naacp and ymca earned her national recognition however being well respected within their community and college educated could not protect the family from the horrors visited by I don't even have to tell you you already know by the 1906 atlanta massacre against their community from september the 22nd and september the 24th you know okay i just started let me go on over two days in september of 1906 when hunting was seven years old white terrorists carrying various weapons attacked her neighborhood at the time, Atlanta's fourth ward was a predominantly black middle-class neighborhood, later home to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Early in the attack, a sympathetic white friend of the family offered them sanctuary, but the Huntons remained in their home, which narrowly escaped the attack. In the aftermath, the Huntons left Atlanta for North Brooklyn, New York, where racism still existed, but so did greater opportunities. I want to put a pin in this so bad and just briefly discuss how many towns and cities that were predominantly black American and also created, founded by black Americans were literally destroyed. Do you know how many, okay, you know how many they already talk about that were destroyed. I think secretly boast about destroying them. But how many we don't know about? Okay, let's remove the pen and continue on. Once settled amongst New York City's black intellectuals, 
The hunted children were enrolled in good schools and later spent a year and a half in Germany. For college, Hunton enrolled in Smith College, from which she would obtain both a bachelor's and master's degree. Smith is located in Northampton, Massachusetts, and was home to then governor and late vice president and president Calvin Coolidge. A professor introduced Hunton to Coolidge, who became a mentor whose home Hunton would spend a lot of time with the family making use of the library. That was cool. Following graduation, Hunton spent a semester back in the South teaching at Baton Rouge Southern University. The experience reminded her of living in the South as a child and in part prompted a return to New York City. Carter followed her mother into social work and became a supervisor in the Harlem Division of the Emergency Unemployment Relief Committee, originally set up as part of President Hoover's program in 1931. Carter met and married her husband, Lyle Carlton Carter, a dentist who was also an immigrant from Barbados. The couple had one child, Lyle Carter Jr. While raising her family, Carter not only kept working, but also got into civil and political rights. Participating as a delegate to the 4th Pan-African Congress in New York City in 1927, the Pan-African Congress was a way for the descendants of the African dysphoria to be represented as the power and authority of European colonization in Africa and that America started to want. Carter then turned her attention to the legal world, an interest that might date back to her grade school years. In 1927, she was accepted to law school at Fordham University and took evening classes while working and fulfilling her family obligations. In 1932, she earned her legal degree from Fordham but found legal jobs for black women were few and far between. Hmm. She was the first black woman to pass the New York State Bar Exam in 1934. She started her own law firm and began to follow court cases that interested her. I'm going to take this time to put a pin in this right quick, right fast. I enjoy discovering things that black Americans did back in the past that were first for them considering the atrocious blatant racism that was against them, but they still found a found a way to bust down those doors and do what they knew they were more than capable to do and then some of these things it was like are you serious i'm like why would you think this was would be so hard for a black person to do you did it and you're not even doing it that well so you really think we can't do it and then they would come in and just like bam and you know supersede them you know that's probably why the barriers were put in place anyway, because they didn't want to be humiliated. They went around the world and said all these lies and stigmatized black Americans. And then here come black Americans, like taking, like basically showing them up on things they created for themselves, you know? But anyway, um, I enjoyed, like I said, discovering things that black Americans do did in the past. Um, but what I don't enjoy is hearing, we are in 2023 and we're hearing about, hey, this person was the first black American appointed to this position in 2023. Let's give her a standing ovation. Ha ha ha. It's like, are you kidding me? How long has your corporation been in existence? 200, 300, 400 years? And you're just now appointing a black person in a high position in 2023 it's like that's an insult am i supposed to be happy and doing cartwheels that arrogance i'm taking the pen out let's continue Carter's work brought her to the attention of the Republican Party. Like many blacks in the first half of the 20th century, she was more aligned with the GOP than the Democrats. She helped the pro-New Deal liberal and even progressive Republican candidates in their bids for office and even after they held office. Yes, there was a time when an alignment to a liberal or conservative agendas was not divided as strictly along party lines as it is today. 
1934, she lost the election for the 19th District of the New York State Assembly as a GOP candidate for around 1,600 votes. Following the 1935 riots in Harlem, her talents drew the attention of New York Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia and newly appointed State Special Prosecutor Dewey in 1935. LaGuardia and Dewey hired a large staff to fight organized crime and selected Carter to work in the predominantly black area of Harlem. Carter thus became the first female African-American assistant district attorney in the state of New York. New York City, like many major American metropolis, has had a problem with organized crime throughout the history, where there are people and a chance for profit the mob under various guises may follow. You, you see how that is? So, pen, please, pen in it. You see how the, the Italian mob is damn near praised? And they did the most violent, ferocious acts that you, com you could commit against people, mankind. But they're praised by this country for some sadistic, masochistic reason. But when it comes to black folks, the Black Panther Party and any other groups that were originally um, created are designed to protect and help the black community, but then down the line got turned out. But anything we created for ourselves to help ourselves is just like, is demonized. You see that? I know I ain't the only one to see that. Okay, let's take the pen back out. Eunice Carter refused to be corrupted or controlled by the mob. Carter's destiny would be to catch an even bigger fish among the city's mob bosses, Lucky Luciano. Luciano rose to prominence as a bootlegger for the Sicilian Mafia during Prohibition. He, if he was... Okay, let me go on. In 1931, he eliminated the old guard Sicilians through murder and intimidation which America for some reason praises. He then created America's first national organized crime syndicate, the Commission, run by New York's five Italian crime families and some top Jewish mobsters such as Schultz, Luciano's longtime friend, Meyer Lansky. By the mid 1930s, Luciano had his hands in multiple rackets from drugs and illegal liquor to loan sharking and numbers and prostitution, either by overseeing them or demanding payments from other operators. Many of Carter's cases as assistant district attorney in 1935 were brought against women charged with prostitution. As prosecutor, she noticed that some defendants were using the same bondsmen and lawyers and told similar tales while trying to beat their raps. Carter, I mean, you didn't, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Okay, they was going to like, it was like 15, 20 different women coming, you know, going before the court, trying to beat this rap. They all were saying the same thing. It's like, nobody thought that through like, hey, you know what? Let's think of like at least five different things or 10 different things these 20 different women can say. So the court won't be like, you know what? Didn't the, the last 50th woman come in here and say the same identical thing? This, throw the book at them. <laughs> Lord, put the pen back. Let me, let, let me, let me uh, take the pen back out. Carter approached Dewey. I'm, I'm trying not to laugh. Carter approached them because <laughs> these people, you think they so smart, but yet they so slow. She approached Dewey and an investigation by his office confirmed her theory. It went too hard to discover that they was BSing. Just, doll, just, just go ahead and say these five words. That's all you got to say. And they told the next 50 people, 50 women to say the same thing. It's okay. We got them. They'll never discover that we're sending it in. Carter approached Dewey and an investigation by his office confirmed her theory. That wasn't a hard theory, sister. 
Racketeers were indeed deeply entrenched in illegal prostitution and collected 50% of their earnings and collected 50% of their employees' earnings. They were called employees. What the health plan looked like. Carter's boss was Dewey, who while chief assistant U.S. attorney had won a conviction against New York bootlegger Waxy Gordon in 1933 and whose 1935 prosecution of mobster Dutch Schultz crippled Schultz's operations. Dewey ordered a raid of scores of brothels and arrested 100 illegal sex workers. Illegal. So I guess he didn't arrest the legal sex workers. Carter interviewed 100 prostitutes, but only three were willing to cooperate and testify about the mob's ties to the business. Luciano was charged with pandering on a large scale. His defense was that he was not directly linked to the brothels and was being railroaded by the prosecution. But Dewey, in a dramatic cross-examination of Luciano, asked how the rich mobster could afford an extravagant lifestyle on the 22500 reported on his tax returns. The sensational trial ended in a guilty verdict and a sentence of 30 to 40 years for Luciano, who was paroled in 1946 and deported to Italy. Luciano's conviction based on Carter's discovery was considered the most successful court action against organized crime in U.S. history. It put a dent in the Luciano syndicate's illicit activities and political corruption. My thing is, where's her series? Where's her movie? See what I'm talking about? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Are you picking up what I'm dropping down? Are you picking up what I dropped down in your lap? Let's continue. Dewey made Carter the head of his special sessions bureau in 1937, which Carter headed until 1945. Her division handled around 14,000 misdemeanors every year. The following year in 1938, her alma mater, Smith College gave her an honorary doctorate. While Carter was undoubtedly one of the highest paid black lawyers in the nation, she was fully aware that she was not paid as well as her male and white colleagues who probably didn't do nowhere near the work she did. But you know how that goes. Beginning in 1945, Carter held several positions at the United Nations over her lifetime that often focused on women, though not only women's issues. By 1947, she was a chair of the UN Committee of Laws. Until her death on January 25, 1970, Carter was actively involved in several organizations, including the Harlem Lawyers Association, the National Association of Women Lawyers, and the NCNW, the National Urban League, the New York Women's Bar Association, and the, y, the YWCA. In 2006, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office placed a plaque listing Carter as the first black woman prosecutor in the state. She was also the inspiration for a character on a television show, Boardwalk Empire, in the seventh episode of their fifth season in 2014. There is a book written about her title, Invisible, the forgotten story of the black woman lawyer who took down America's most powerful mobster. I have that book, although I didn't read it to get this content. You know, I didn't, I didn't really want to read the book because I like to copy and paste. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to it when I take that long vacation. I have a whole lot of books that I'm going to get to. I, I thoroughly enjoy um, still buying hard copy books. I don't, I don't like Kindle. I have some books on my Kindle, but I prefer hard copy books. But yeah, that you know, there, there. I, I applaud her and her efforts, and you know, I learned that 
black Americans, the reason why they always supersede and triumph over obstacles that were placed in front of them intentionally, they always supersede it because when you tell a person, when you continuously tell a person what they can't do, they gon' they gonna show you what they can do and more. So it's like all you did was just build up a group of tenacious, strong wielded people who know that whatever you try to do to keep them down, they're going to always bust through it. Okay, that was the end of the story. Thank you for your time. And I will be back as soon as possible with another installment to our series titled The First. Thanks again. Have a great day.